Section 20 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 23. Conditions of the Increase of Color. 323. 209. Here, too, an increased displacement of the object produces a greater appearance of color. 324, 210. This increased displacement occurs, 1. By a more oblique direction of the impinging luminous object through mediums with parallel surfaces, 2. By changing the parallel form for one more or less acute angled, 3. By increased proportion of the medium whether parallel or acute angled, partly because the object is by this means more powerfully displaced, partly because an effect depending on the mere mass cooperates, four, by the distance of the recipient surface from the refracting medium, so that the colored spectrum emerging from the prism may be said to have a longer way to travel, five, when a chemical property produces its effects under all these circumstances, this we have already entered into more fully under the head of a chromatism and hyperchromatism. 325, 211. The objective experiments have this advantage, that the progressive states of the phenomenon may be arrested and clearly represented by diagrams, which is not the case with the subjective experiments. 326. We can observe the luminous image after it has emerged from the prism step by step and mark its increasing color by receiving it on a plane at different distances, thus exhibiting before our eyes various sections of this cone with an elliptical base. Again, the phenomenon may at once be rendered beautifully visible throughout its whole course in the following manner. Let a cloud of fine white dust be excited along the line in which the image passes through the dark space. The cloud is best produced by fine, perfectly dry hair powder. The more or less colored appearance will now be painted on the white atoms and presented in its whole length and breadth to the eye of the spectator. 327. By this means we have prepared some diagrams which will be found among the plates. In these the appearance is exhibited from its first origin, and by these the spectator can clearly comprehend why the luminous image is so much more powerfully colored through prisms than through parallel mediums. 328, 212. At the two opposite outlines of the image, an opposite appearance presents itself beginning from an acute angle. The appearance spreads as it proceeds further in space according to this angle. On one side, in the direction in which the luminous image is moved, a violet border advances on the dark. A narrow blue edge remains in the next outline of the image. On the opposite side, a yellow border advances into the light of the image itself and a yellow-red edge remains at the outline. 329-213 Here, therefore, the movement of the dark against the light, of the light against the dark, may be clearly observed. 330-214 The center of a large object remains long uncolored, especially with mediums of less density and smaller angles. But at last the opposite borders and edges touch each other, upon which a green appears in the center of the luminous image. 331, 215. Objective experiments have been usually made with the sun's image. An objective experiment with a dark object has hitherto scarcely been thought of. We have, however, prepared a convenient contrivance for this also. Let the large water prism before alluded to be placed in the sun and let a round pasteboard disc be fastened either inside or outside. The colored appearance will again take place at the outline, beginning according to the usual law. The edges will appear, they will spread in the same proportion, and when they meet, red will appear in the center. An intercepting square may be added near the round disc and placed in any direction ad libitum, and the spectator can again convince himself of what has been before so often described. 332-216. If we take away these dark objects from the prism, in which case, however, the glass is to be carefully cleaned, and hold a rod or a large pencil before the center of the horizontal prism, we shall then accomplish the complete immixture of the violet border and the yellow-red edge, and see only the three colors, the external blue and yellow, and the central red. 
333. If again we cut a long horizontal opening in the middle of a piece of pasteboard, fastened on the prism, and then cause the sunlight to pass through it, we shall accomplish the complete union of the yellow border with the blue edge upon the light, and only see yellow-red, green, and violet. The details of this are further entered into in the description of the plates. 334-217. The prismatic appearance is thus by no means complete and final when the luminous image emerges from the prism. It is then only that we perceive its elements in contrast, for as it increases, these contrasting elements unite and are at last intimately joined. The section of this phenomenon arrested on a plane surface is different at every angle of distance from the prism, so that the notion of an immutable series of colors, or of a pervading similar proportion between them, cannot be a question for a moment. Section 24. Explanation of the foregoing phenomena. 335-218. As we have already entered into this analysis circumstantially while treating of the subjective experiments, as all that was of force there is equally valid here, it will require no long details in addition to show that the phenomena, which are entirely parallel in the two cases, may also be traced precisely to the same sources. 336-219. That in objective experiments also we have to do with circumscribed images has already been demonstrated at large. The sun may shine through the smallest opening, yet the image of the whole disk penetrates beyond. The largest prism may be placed in the open sunlight, yet it is still the sun's image that is bounded by the edges of the refracting surfaces, and produces the accessory images of this boundary. We may fasten pasteboard with many openings cut in it before the water prism, yet we still merely see multiplied images which, after having been moved from their place by refraction, exhibit colored edges and borders, and in these mere accessory images. 337-235. In subjective experiments we have seen that objects strongly relieved from each other produce a very lively appearance of color, and this will be the case in objective experiments in a much more vivid and splendid degree. The sun's image is the most powerful brightness we know. Hence its accessory image will be energetic in proportion, and notwithstanding its really secondary dimmed and darkened character, must still be very brilliant. The colors thrown by the sunlight through the prism on any object carry a powerful light with them, for they have the highest and most intense source of light, as it were, for their ground. 338. That we are warranted in calling even these accessory images semi-transparent, thus deducing the appearances from the doctrine of the semi-transparent mediums, we will be clear to every one who has followed us thus far, but particularly to those who have supplied themselves with the necessary apparatus, so as to be enabled at all times to witness the precision and vivacity with which semi-transparent mediums act. End of section 20. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 21 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Catherine. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 21, Part 25. Decrease of the Appearance of Color. 339. If we could afford to be concise in the description of the decreasing colored appearance in subjective cases, we may here be permitted to proceed with still greater brevity while we refer to the former distinct statement. One circumstance only on account of its great importance may be here recommended to the reader's special attention as a leading point of our whole thesis. 340. The decline of the prismatic appearance must be preceded by its separation, by its resolution into its elements. At the due distance from the prism, the image of the sun being entirely colored, the blue and yellow at length mix completely, and we see only yellow-red, green and blue-red. If we bring the recipient surface nearer to the refracting medium, 
yellow and blue appear again, and we see the five colors with their gradations. At a still shorter distance, the yellow and blue separate from each other entirely. The green vanishes, and the image itself appears, colorless, between the colored edges and borders. The nearer we bring the recipient surface to the prism, the narrower the edges and borders become. Till, at last, when in contact with the prism, they are reduced to nothing. Part 26. Grey Objects 341. We have exhibited grey objects as very important to our inquiry in the subjective experiments. They show, by the faintness of the accessory images, that these same images are in all cases derived from the principal object. We wish here, too, to carry on the objective experiments parallel with the others, we may conveniently do this by placing a more or less dull ground glass before the opening through which the sun's image enters. By this means, a subdued image would be produced, which on being refracted would exhibit much duller colors on the recipient plane than those immediately derived from the sun's disk. And thus, even from the intense sun image, only a faint accessory image would appear, proportioned to the mitigation of the light by the glass. This experiment, it is true, will only again and again confirm what is already sufficiently familiar to us. Part 27 Colored Objects 342 there are various modes of producing colored images in objective experiments. In the first place, we can fix colored glass before the opening, by which means a colored image is at once produced. Secondly, we can fill the water prism with colored fluids. Thirdly, we can cause the colors already produced in their full vivacity by the prism to pass through proportionate small openings in a thin plate, and thus prepare small circumscribed colors for a second operation. This last mode is the most difficult, for owing to the continual progress of the sun, the image cannot be arrested in any direction at will. The second method has also its inconveniences, since not all colored liquids can be prepared perfectly bright and clear. On these accounts, the first is to be preferred and deserves the more to be adopted because natural philosophers have hitherto chosen to consider the colors produced from the sunlight through the prism, those produced through liquids and glasses, and those which are already fixed on paper or cloth as exhibiting effects equally to be depended on and equally available in demonstration. 343. As it is thus merely necessary that the image should be colored, so the large water prism before alluded to affords us the best means of effecting this. A pasteboard screen may be contrived to slide before the large surfaces of the prism, through which, in the first instance, the light passes uncolored. In this screen openings of various forms may be cut, in order to produce different images, and, consequently, different accessory images. This being done, we need only fix colored glasses before the openings in order to observe what effect refraction produces on colored images in an objective sense. 344. A series of glasses may be prepared in a mode similar to that before described. These should be accurately contrived to slide in the grooves of the large water prism. Let the sun then shine through them, and the colored images refracted upwards will appear bordered and edged, 
and will vary accordingly. For these borders and edges will be exhibited quite distinctly on some images and on others will be mixed with the specific color of the glass, which they will either enhance or neutralize. Every observer will be enabled to convince himself here again that we have only to do with the same simple phenomenon so circumstantially described subjectively and objectively. Part 28 A Chromatism and Hypochromatism 345 It is possible to make the hypochromatic and achromatic experiments objectively as well as subjectively. After what has been already stated, a short description of the method will suffice, especially as we take it for granted that the compound prism before mentioned is in the hands of the observer. 346. Let the sun's image pass through an acute angled prism of few degrees, prepared from crown glass, so that the spectrum be refracted upwards on an opposite surface. The edges will appear colored according to the constant law, namely the violet and blue above and outside, the yellow and yellow-red below and within the image. As the refracting angle of this prism is undermost, let another proportionate prism of flint glass be placed against it, with its refracting angle uppermost. The sun's image will by this means be again moved to its place, where, owing to the excess of the coloring power of the prism of flint glass, it will still appear a little colored and, in consequence of the direction in which it has been moved, the blue and violet will now appear underneath and outside, the yellow and yellow-red above and inside. 347. If the whole image be now moved a little upwards by a proportionate prism of crown glass, the hypochromatism will disappear, the sun's image will be moved from its place and yet will appear colorless. 348. With an achromatic object glass composed of three glasses, this experiment may be made step by step if we do not mind taking out the glasses from their setting. The two convex glasses of crown glass in contracting the sun's image towards the focus the concave glass of flint glass, in dilating the image beyond it, exhibit at the edges the usual colors. A convex glass united with a concave one exhibits the colors according to the law of the latter. If all three glasses are placed together, whether we contract the sun's image towards the focus or suffer it to dilate beyond the focus, Colored edges never appear, and the achromatic effect intended by the optician is, in this case, again attained. 349. But as the crown glass has always a greenish tint, and as a tendency to this hue may be more decided in large and strong object glasses, and under certain circumstances produce the compensatory red, which, however, in repeated experiments with several instruments of this kind did not occur to us, philosophers have resorted to the most extraordinary modes of explaining such a result, and having been compelled, in support of their system, theoretically to prove the impossibility of achromatic telescopes, have felt a kind of satisfaction in having some apparent ground for denying so great an improvement. Of this, however, we can only treat circumstantially in our historical account of these discoveries. End of section 21. Recording by Catherine. Section 22 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. 
Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 22. Combination of Subjective and Objective Experiments. 350. Having shown above, 318, that refraction considered objectively and subjectively must act in opposite directions, it will follow that if we combine the experiments, the effects will reciprocally destroy each other. 351. Let the sun's image be thrown upwards on a vertical plane through a horizontally placed prism. If the prism is long enough to admit of the spectator also looking through it, he will see the image elevated by the objective refraction again depressed, and in the same place in which it appeared without refraction. 352. Here a remarkable case presents itself, but at the same time a natural result of a general law. For, since as often before stated, the objective sun's image thrown on the vertical plane is not an ultimate or unchangeable state of the phenomenon, so in the above operation the image is not only depressed when seen through the prism, but its edges and borders are entirely robbed of their hues, and the spectrum is reduced to a colorless circular form. 353. By employing two perfectly similar prisms placed next to each other, for this experiment we can transmit the sun's image through one, and look through the other. 354. If the spectator advances nearer with the prism through which he looks, the image is again elevated, and by degrees becomes colored according to the law of the first prism. If he again retires till he has brought the image to the neutralized point, and then retires still further away, the image, which had become round and colorless, moves still more downwards and becomes colored in the opposite sense, so that if we look through the prism and upon the refracted spectrum at the same time, we see the same image colored according to subjective and objective laws. 355. The modes in which this experiment may be varied are obvious. If the refracting angle of the prism, through which the sun's image was objectively elevated, is greater than that of the prism through which the observer looks, he must retire to a much greater distance in order to depress the colored image so low on the vertical plane that it shall appear colorless and vice versa. 356. It will be easily seen that we may exhibit achromatic and hyperchromatic effects in a similar manner, and we leave it to the amateur to follow all such researches more fully. Other complicated experiments in which prisms and lenses are employed together, others again in which objective and subjective experiments are variously intermixed, we reserve for a future occasion when it will be our object to trace such effects to the simple phenomena with which you are now sufficiently familiar chapter thirty transition three fifty seven in looking back on the description and analysis of dioptrical colours we do not repent either that we have treated them so circumstantially or that we have taken them into consideration before the other physical colours out of the order we ourselves laid down Yet before we quit this branch of our inquiry, it may be as well to state the reasons that we have weighed with us. 358. If some apology is necessary for having treated the theory of the dioptrical colors, particularly those of the second class, so diffusely, we should observe that the exposition of any branch of knowledge is to be considered partly with reference to the intrinsic importance of the subject and partly with reference to the particular necessities of the time in which the inquiry is undertaken in our own case we were forced to keep both these considerations constantly in view in the first place we had to state a mass of experiments with our consequent convictions next it was our special aim to exhibit certain phenomena known it is true but misunderstood and above all exhibited in false connection in that natural and progressive development which is strictly and truly conformable to observation in order that hereafter in our polemical or historical investigations we might be enabled to bring a complete preparatory analysis to bear on and elucidate our general view the details we have entered into were on this account unavoidable they may be considered as a reluctant consequence of the occasion hereafter when philosophers will look upon a simple principle as simple a combined effect as combined when they will acknowledge the first elementary 
and the second complicated states for what they are then indeed all this statement may be abridged to a narrower form a labour which should we ourselves not be able to accomplish it we bequeath to the active interest of contemporaries and posterity three fifty nine with respect to the order of the chapters it should be remembered that natural phenomena which are even allied to each other are not connected in any particular sequence or constant series their efficient causes act in a narrow circle so that it is in some sort indifferent what phenomenon is first or last considered the main point is that all should be as far as possible present to us in order that we may embrace them at last from one point of view partly according to their nature partly according to generally received methods three sixty yet in the present particular instance it may be asserted that the dioptrical colours are justly placed at the head of the physical colours not only on account of their striking splendour and their importance in other respects but because in tracing these to their source much was necessarily entered into which will assist our subsequent inquiries three sixty one for hitherto light has been considered as a kind of abstract principle existing and acting independently to a certain extent self-modified and on the slightest cause producing colours out of itself to divert the votaries of physical science from this mode of viewing the subject to make them attentive to the fact that in prismatic and other appearances we have not to do with light as an uncircumscribed and modifying principle but as circumscribed and modified that we have to do with a luminous image with images or circumscribed objects generally whether light or dark this was the purpose we had in view and such is the problem to be solved three sixty two all that takes place in dioptrical cases especially those of the second class which are connected with the phenomena of refraction is now sufficiently familiar to us and will serve as an introduction to what follows three sixty three catoptrical appearances remind us of the physiological phenomena but as we ascribe a more objective character to the former we thought ourselves justified in classing them with the physical examples it is of importance however to remember that here again it is not light in an abstract sense but a luminous image that we have to consider three sixty four in proceeding onwards to the paroptical class the reader if duly acquainted with the foregoing facts will be pleased to find himself once more in the region of circumscribed forms the shadows of bodies especially as secondary images so exactly accompanying the object will serve greatly to elucidate analogous appearances three sixty five we will not however anticipate these statements but proceed as heretofore in what we consider the regular course. End of section 22. Section 23 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Rosso. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake section twenty three chapter thirty one catoptrical colours three sixty six catoptrical colours are such as appear in consequence of a mirror-like reflection we assume in the first place that the light itself as well as the surface from which it is reflected is perfectly colourless in this sense the appearances in question come under the head of physical colours they arise in consequence of reflection as we found that the optical colours of the second class appear by means of refraction without further general definitions we turn our attention at once to particular cases and to the conditions which are essential to the exhibition of these phenomena three sixty seven if we unroll a coil of bright steel wire and after suffering it to spring confusedly together again place it at a window in the light we shall see the prominent parts of the circles and convolutions illuminated but neither resplendent nor iridescent but if the sun shines on the wire this light will be condensed into a point and we perceive a small resplendent image of the sun which when seen near exhibits no colour on retiring a little however and fixing the eyes on this refulgent appearance we discern several small mirrored suns coloured in the most varied manner 
and although the impression is that green and red predominate, yet on a more accurate inspection we find that the other colours are also present. 368. If we take an eyeglass and examine the appearance through it, we find the colours have vanished, as well as the radiating splendour in which they were seen, and we perceive only the small luminous points, the repeated images of the sun. We thus find that the impression is subjective in its nature, and that the appearance is allied to those which we have averted under the name of radiating halos. 369. We can, however, exhibit this phenomenon objectively. Let a piece of white paper be fastened beneath a small aperture in the lid of a camera obscura, and when the sun shines through this aperture, let the confusedly rolled steel wire be held in the light so that it be opposite to the paper. The sunlight will impinge on and in the circles of the wire and will not, as in the concentrating lens of the eye, display itself in a point. But as the paper can receive the reflection of the light, in every part of its surface will be seen in hair-like lines, which are also iridescent. 370. This experiment is purely catoptrical, for, as we cannot imagine that the light penetrates the surface of the steel and thus undergoes a change, we are soon convinced that we have here a mere reflection which, in its subjective character, is connected with a theory of faintly acting lights and the after-image of dazzling lights, and as far as it can be considered objective, announces even in the minutest appearances a real effect independent of the action and reaction of the eye. 371. We have seen that to produce these effects, not merely light, but a powerful light is necessary. That this powerful light, again, is not an abstract and general quality, but a circumscribed light, a luminous image. We can convince ourselves still further of this by analogous cases. 372. A polished surface of silver placed in the sun reflects a dazzling light, but in this case no color is seen. If, however, we slightly scratch the surface, an iridescent appearance, in which green and red are conspicuous, will be exhibited at a certain angle. In chased and carved metals the effect is striking, yet it may be remarked throughout that, in order to its appearance, some form, some alternation of light and dark must cooperate with the reflection. Thus a window bar, the stem of a tree, an accidentally or purposely interposed object, produces a perceptible effect. This appearance, too, may be exhibited objectively in the camera obscura. 373. If we cause a polished plate surface to be so acted on by aqua fortis that the copper within it is touched, and the surface itself thus rendered rough, and if the sun's image be then reflected from it, the splendour will be reverberated from every minutest prominence, and the surface will appear iridescent. So if we hold a sheet of black unglazed paper in the sun and look at it attentively, it will be seen to glisten in its minutest points with the most vivid colours. 374. All these examples are referable to the same conditions. In the first case, the luminous image is reflected from a thin line. In the second, probably from sharp edges. In the third, from very small points. In all, a very powerful and circumscribed light is requisite. For all these appearances of color again, it is necessary that the eye should be at a due distance from the reflecting points. 375. If these observations are made with a microscope, the appearance will be greatly increased in force and splendor, for we then see the smallest portion of the surfaces lit by the sun, glittering in these colors of reflection, which, allied to the hues of refraction, now attain their highest degree of brilliancy. In such cases, we may observe a vermiform iridescence on the surface of organic bodies, the further description of which will be given hereafter. 376. Lastly, the colours which are chiefly exhibited in reflection are red and green, whence we may infer that the linear appearance especially consists of a thin line of red, bounded by blue on one side and yellow on the other. If these triple lines approach very near together, the intermediate space must appear green, a phenomenon which will often occur to us as we proceed. 377. We frequently meet with these colours in nature. 
the colours of the spider's web might be considered exactly of the same class with those reflected from the steel wire except that the non-translucent quality of the former is not so certain as in the case of steel on which account some have been inclined to class the colours of spiders web with the phenomena of the refraction three seventy eight in mother of pearl we perceive infinitely fine organic fibres and lamellae in juxtaposition from which as from the scratched silver before alluded to varied colours but especially red and green may arise three seventy nine the changing colours of the plumage of birds may also be mentioned here although in all organic instances a chemical principle and an adaptation of the colour to the structure may be assumed considerations to which we shall return in treating of chemical colours three eighty that the appearances of objective halos also approximate catoptrical phenomena will be readily admitted while we again do not deny that refraction as well may here come into the account for the present we restrict ourselves to one or two observations hereafter we may be enabled to make a fuller application of general principles to particular examples three eighty one we first call to mind the yellow and red circles produced on a white or grey wall by a light placed near it eighty eight light when reflected appears subdued and the subdued light excites the impression of yellow and subsequently of red three eighty two let the wall be illuminated by a candle placed quite close to it the farther the light is diffused the fainter it becomes but it is still the effect of the flame the continuation of its action the dilated effect of its image we might therefore very fairly call these circles reiterated images because they constitute the successive boundaries of the action of the light and yet at the same time only present an extended image of the flame three eighty three if the sky is white and luminous round the sun owing to the atmosphere being filled with light vapours if mists or clouds pass before the moon the reflection of the disc mirrors itself in them the halos we then perceive are single or double smaller or greater sometimes very large often colourless sometimes coloured three eighty four i witnessed a very beautiful halo round the moon the fifteenth of november seventeen ninety nine when the barometer stood high the sky was cloudy and vapory the halo was completely coloured and the circles were concentric round the light as in subjective halos that this halo was objective i was presently convinced by covering the moon's disc when the same circles were nevertheless perfectly visible three eighty five the different extent of the halos appears to have a relation with the proximity of distance of the vapour from the eye of the observer three eighty six as window panes lightly breathed upon increase the brilliancy of subjective halos and in some degree give them an objective character so perhaps with a simple contrivance in winter during a quickly freezing temperature a more exact definition of this might be arrived at three eighty seven how much reason we have in considering these circles to insist on the image and its effects is apparent in the phenomenon of the so-called double suns similar double images always occur in certain points of halos and circles and only present in a circumscribed form what takes place in a more general way in the whole circle all this will be more conveniently treated in connection with the appearance of the rainbow note q 388 in conclusion it is only necessary to point out the affinity between the catoptrical and paroptical colours we call those paroptical colours which appear when the light passes by the edge of an opaque colourless body how nearly these are allied to dioptrical colours of the second class will be easily seen by those who are convinced with us that the colours of refraction take place only at the edges of objects the affinity again between the catoptrical and paroptical colours will be evident in the following chapter. End of section 23Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, translated by Charles Eastlake, section twenty-four, chapter thirty-two, paroptical colors, 
389 the paroptical colours have been hitherto called perioptical because a peculiar effect of light was supposed to take place as it were round the object and was ascribed to a certain flexibility of the light to and from the object 390 these colours again may be divided into subjective and objective because they appear partly without us as it were painted on surfaces and partly within us immediately on the retina in this chapter we shall find it more to our purpose to take the objective cases first since the subjective are so closely connected with other appearances already known to us that it is hardly possible to separate them 391 the paroptical colors then are so called because the light must pass by an outline or edge to produce them they do not however always appear in this case to produce the effect very particular conditions are necessary besides 392 it is also to be observed that in this instance again light does not act as an abstract diffusion 361 the sun shines towards an edge the volume of light poured from the sun image passes by the edge of a substance and occasions shadows within these shadows we shall presently find colors appear 393 but above all we should make the experiments and observations that bear upon our present inquiry in the fullest light we therefore place the observer in the open air before we conduct him to the limits of a dark room 394 a person walking in sunshine in a garden or on any level path may observe that his shadow only appears sharply defined next the foot on which he rests farther from this point especially round the head it melts away into the bright crown for as the sunlight proceeds not only from the middle of the sun but also acts crosswise from the two extremes of every diameter an objective parallax takes place which produces a half shadow on both sides of the object 395 if the person walking raises and spreads his hands he distinctly sees in the shadow of each finger the diverging separation of the two half shadows outwards and the diminution of the principal shadow inwards both being effects of the cross action of the light 396 this experiment may be repeated and varied before a smooth wall with rods of different thickness and again with balls we shall always find that the further the object is removed from the surface of the wall the more the weak double shadow spreads and the more the forcible main shadow diminishes till at last the main shadow appears quite effaced and even the double shadows become so faint that they almost disappear at a still greater distance they are in fact imperceptible 397 that this is caused by the cross action of the light we may easily convince ourselves for the shadow of a pointed object plainly exhibits two points we must thus never lose sight of the fact that in this case the whole sun image acts produces shadows changes them to double shadows and finally obliterates them 398 instead of solid bodies let us now take openings cut of various given sizes next each other and let the sun shine through them on a plain surface at some little distance we shall find that the bright image produced by the sun on the surface is larger than the opening this is because one edge of the sun shines towards the opposite edge of the opening while the other edge of the disc is excluded on that side hence the bright image is more weakly lighted towards the edges 399 if we take square openings of any size we please we shall find that the bright image on a surface nine feet from the opening is on every side about an inch larger than the opening thus nearly corresponding with the angle of the apparent diameter of the sun 400 that the brightness should gradually diminish towards the edges of the image is quite natural for at last only a minimum of the light can act crosswise from the sun's circumference through the edge of the aperture 401 thus we here again see how much reason we have in actual observation to guard against the assumption of parallel rays bundles and faces of rays and the like hypothetical notions 402 we might rather consider the splendor of the sun or of any light as an infinite specular multiplication of the circumscribed luminous image whence it may be explained that all square openings through which the sun shines at certain distances 
according as the apertures are greater or smaller, must give a round image of light. 403. The above experiments may be repeated through openings of various shapes and sizes, and the same effect will always take place at proportionate distances. In all these cases, however, we may still observe that in a full light, and while the sun merely shines past an edge, no color is apparent. 404. We therefore proceed to experiments with a subdued light, which is essential to the appearance of color. Let a small opening be made in the window shutter of a dark room. Let the crossing sunlight which enters be received on a surface of white paper, and we shall find that the smaller the opening is, the dimmer the light image will be. This is quite obvious, because the paper does not receive light from the whole sun, but partially from single points of its disk. 405. If we look attentively at this dim image of the sun, we find it still dimmer towards the outlines where a yellow border is perceptible. The color is still more apparent if a vapor or a transparent cloud passes before the sun, thus subduing and dimming its brightness. The halo on the wall, the effect of the decreasing brightness of a light placed near it, is here forced on our recollection. 88. 406. If we examine the image more accurately, we perceive that this yellow border is not the only appearance of color. We can see besides a bluish circle, if not even a halo-like repetition of the colored border. If the room is quite dark, we discern that the sky next to the sun also has its effect. We see the blue sky, nay, even the whole landscape, on the paper, and are thus again convinced that, as far as regards the sun, we have here only to do with a luminous image. 407. If we take a somewhat larger square opening, so large that the image of the sun shining through it does not immediately become round, we may distinctly observe the half-shadows of every edge or side, the junction of these in the corners, and their colors, just as in the above-mentioned appearance with a round opening. 408. We have now subdued a parallactic light by causing it to shine through small apertures, but we have not taken from it its parallactic character, so that it can produce double shadows of bodies, although with diminished power. These double shadows, which we have hitherto been describing, follow each other in light and dark, colored and colorless circles, and produce repeated, nay, almost innumerable halos. These effects have been often represented in drawings and engravings. By placing needles, hairs, and other small bodies in the subdued light, the numerous halo-like double shadows may be increased. Thus observed, they have been ascribed to an alternating flexile action of the light, and the same assumption has been employed to explain the obliteration of the central shadow and the appearance of a light in the place of the dark. 409. For ourselves, we maintain that these again are parallactic double shadows, which appear edged with colored borders and halos. 410. After having seen and investigated the foregoing phenomena, we can proceed with the experiments with knife blades exhibiting effects which may be referred to the contact and parallactic mutual intersection of the half-shadows and halos already familiar to us. 411. Lastly, the observer may follow out the experiments with hairs, needles, and wires in the half-light produced as before described by the sun, as well as in that derived from the blue sky, and indicated on the white paper. He will thus make himself still better acquainted with the true nature of this phenomenon. 412. But since in these experiments everything depends on our being persuaded of the parallactic action of the light, we can make this more evident by means of two sources of light, the two shadows from which intersect each other and may be altogether separated. By day this may be contrived with two small openings in a window shutter, by night with two candles. There are even accidental effects in interiors on opening and closing shutters by means of which you can better observe these appearances than with the most careful apparatus. But still, all and each of these may be reduced to experiment by preparing a box which the observer can look into from above, and gradually diminishing the openings after having caused the double light to shine in. In this case, as might be expected, the colored shadow, considered under the physiological colors, appears very easily. 413. It is necessary to remember generally what has been before stated with regard to the nature of double shadows, half-lights, and the like. 
experiments also should especially be made with different shades of grey placed next each other where every stripe will appear light by a darker and dark by a lighter stripe next it if at night with three or more lights we produce shadows which cross each other successively we can observe this phenomenon very distinctly and we shall be convinced that the physiological case before more fully treated here comes into the account section thirty eight four hundred fourteen to what extent the appearances that accompany the paroptical colours may be derived from the doctrine of subdued lights from half shadows and from the physiological disposition of the retina or whether we shall be forced to take refuge in certain intrinsic qualities of light as has hitherto been done time may teach suffice it here to have pointed out the conditions under which the paroptical colours appear and we may hope that our allusion to their connection with the facts before adduced by us will not remain unnoticed by the observers of nature four hundred and fifteen the affinity of the paroptical colours with the dioptrical of the second class will also be readily seen and followed up by every reflecting investigator here as in those instances we have to do with edges or boundaries here as in those instances with a light which appears at the outline how natural therefore it is to conclude that the paroptical effects may be heightened strengthened and enriched by the dioptrical since however the luminous image actually shines through the medium we can here only have to do with objective cases of refraction it is these which are strictly allied to the paroptical cases the subjective cases of refraction where we see objects through the medium are quite distinct from the paroptical we have already recommended them on account of their clearness and simplicity 416 the connection between the paroptical colours and the catoptrical may be already inferred from what has been said for as the catoptrical colours only appear on scratches points steel wire and delicate threads so it is nearly the same case as if the light shone past an edge the light must always be reflected from an edge in order to produce colour here again as before pointed out the partial action of the luminous image and the subduing of the light are both to be taken into account 417 we add but few observations on the subjective paroptical colours because these may be classed partly with the physiological colours partly with the dioptrical of the second order the greater part hardly seem to belong here but when attentively considered they still diffuse a satisfactory light over the whole doctrine and establish its connection 418 if we hold a ruler before the eyes so that the flame of a light just appears above it we see the ruler as it were intended and notched at the place where the light appears this seems deducible from the expansive power of light acting on the retina 18 419 the same phenomenon on a large scale is exhibited at sunrise for when the orb appears distinctly but not too powerfully so that we can still look at it it always makes a sharp indentation in the horizon 420 if when the sky is grey we approach a window so that the dark cross of the window bars be relieved on the sky if after fixing the eyes on the horizontal bar we bend the head a little forward on half closing the eyes as we look up we shall presently perceive a bright yellow red border under the bar and a bright light blue one above it the duller and more monotonous the grey of the sky the more dusky the room and consequently the more previously unexcited the eye the livelier the appearance will be but it may be seen by an attentive observer even in bright daylight 421 if we move the head backwards while half closing the eyes so that the horizontal bar be seen below the phenomenon will appear reversed the upper edge will appear yellow the under edge blue 422 such observations are best made in a dark room if white paper is spread before the opening where the solar microscope is commonly fastened the lower edge of the circle will appear blue the upper yellow even while the eyes are quite open or only by half closing them so far that a halo no longer appears round the white if the head is moved backwards the colours are reversed 423 these phenomena seem to prove that the humours of the eye are in fact only really achromatic in the centre where vision takes place but that towards the circumference and in unusual motions of the eyes 
as in looking horizontally when the head is bent backwards or forwards a chromatic tendency remains especially when distinctly relieved objects are thus looked at hence such phenomena may be considered as allied to the dioptrical colours of the second class 424 similar colours appear if we look on black and white objects through a pinhole in a card instead of a white object we may take the minute light aperture in the tin plate of a camera obscura as prepared for paroptical experiments 425 if we look through a tube the farther end of which is contracted or variously indented the same colours appear 426 the following phenomena appear to me to be more nearly allied to the paroptical appearances if we hold up a needle near the eye the point appears double a particularly remarkable effect again is produced if we look towards a grey sky through the blades of knives prepared for paroptical experiments we seem to look through a gauze a multitude of threads appear to the eye these are in fact only the reiterated images of the sharp edges each of which is successively modified by the next or perhaps modified in a parallactic sense by the oppositely acting one the whole mass being thus changed to a thread-like appearance 427 lastly it is to be remarked that if we look through the blades towards a minute light in the window shutter coloured stripes and halos appear on the retina as on the paper 428 the present chapter may be here terminated the less reluctantly as a friend has undertaken to investigate this subject by further experiments in our recapitulation in the description of the plates and apparatus we hope hereafter to give an account of his observations end of section twenty four section twenty five of theory of colors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by simona rosu theory of colors by johann wolfgang von goethe translated by charles eastlake section twenty five chapter thirty three epoptical colors four twenty nine we have hitherto had to do with colors which appear with vivacity but which immediately vanish again when certain conditions cease we have now to become acquainted with others which it is true are still to be considered as transient but which under certain circumstances become so fixed that even after the conditions which first occasioned their appearance cease they still remain and thus constitute the link between the physical and the chemical colours four hundred and thirty they appear from various causes on the surface of a colourless body originally without communication dye or immersion vafi and we now proceed to trace them from their faintest indication to their most permanent state through the different conditions of their appearance which for easier survey we here at once summarily state four hundred and thirty one first condition the contact of two smooth surfaces of hard transparent bodies first case if masses or plates of glass or if lenses are pressed against each other second case if a crack takes place in a solid mass of glass crystal or ice third case if lamellae of transparent stones become separated second condition if a surface of glass or a polished stone is breathed upon third condition the combination of the two last first breathing on the glass then placing another plate of glass upon it thus exciting the colours by pressure then removing the upper glass upon which the colours begin to fade and vanish with the breath fourth condition bubbles of various liquids soap chocolate beer wine fine glass bubbles fifth condition very fine pellicles and lamellae produced by the decomposition of minerals and metals the pellicles of lime the surface of stagnant water especially if impregnated with iron and again pellicles of oil on water especially of varnish on aqua fortis sixth condition if metals are heated the operation of imparting tints to steel and other metals seventh condition if the surface of glass is beginning to decompose 432 first condition first case 
if two convex glasses or a convex and plane glass or best of all a convex and concave glass come in contact concentric coloured circles appear the phenomenon exhibits itself immediately on the slightest pressure and may then be gradually carried through various successive states we will describe the complete appearance at once and we shall then be better enabled to follow the different states through which it passes four hundred and thirty three the centre is colourless where the glasses are so to speak united in one by the strongest pressure a dark grey point appears with a silver white space round it then follow in decreasing distances various insulated rings all consisting of three colours which are in immediate contact with each other each of these rings of which perhaps three or four might be counted is yellow on the inner side blue on the outer and red in the centre between two rings there appears a silver white interval the rings which are furthest from the centre are always nearer together they are composed of red and green without a perceptible white space between them four hundred and thirty four we will now observe the appearances in their gradual formation beginning from the slightest pressure four hundred and thirty five on the slightest pressure the centre itself appears of a green colour then follow as far as the concentric circles extend red and green rings they are wide accordingly and no trace of a silver white space is to be seen between them the green is produced by the blue of an imperfectly developed circle mixing with the yellow of the first circle all the remaining circles are in this slight contact broad their yellow and blue edges mixed together thus producing a beautiful green the red however of each circle remains pure and untouched hence the whole series is composed of these two colours four hundred and thirty six a somewhat stronger pressure separates the first circle by a slight interval from the imperfectly developed one it is thus detached and may be said to appear in a complete state the centre is now a blue point for the yellow of the first circle is now separated from this central point by a silver white space from the centre of the blue a red appears which is thus in all cases bounded on the outside by its blue edge the second and third rings from the centre are quite detached where deviations from this order present themselves the observer will be enabled to account for them from what has been or remains to be stated four hundred and thirty seven on a stronger pressure the centre becomes yellow this yellow is surrounded by a red and blue edge at last the yellow also retires from the centre the innermost circle is formed and is bounded with yellow the whole centre itself now appears silver white till at last on the strongest pressure the dark point appears and the phenomenon as described at first is complete four hundred and thirty eight the relative size of the concentric circles and their intervals depends on the form of the glasses which are pressed together four hundred and thirty nine we remarked above that the coloured centre is in fact an undeveloped circle it is however often found on the slightest pressure that several undeveloped circles exist there as it were in the germ these can be successively developed before the eye of the observer four hundred and forty the regularity of these rings is owing to the form of the convex glasses and the diameter of the coloured appearance depends on the greater or lesser section of a circle on which a lens is polished we easily conclude from this that by pressing plain glasses together irregular appearances only will be produced the colours in fact undulate like watered silks and spread from the point of pressure in all directions yet the phenomenon as thus exhibited is much more splendid than in the former instance and cannot fail to strike every spectator if we make the experiment in this mode we shall distinctly see as in the other case that on a slight pressure the green and red waves appear on a stronger stripes of blue red and yellow become detached at first the outer sides of these stripes touch on increased pressure they are separated by a silver white space four hundred and forty one before we proceed to a further description of this phenomenon we may point out the most convenient mode of exhibiting it place a large convex glass on a table near the window upon this glass lay a plate of well-polished mirror glass about the size of a playing card 
and the mere weight of the plate will press sufficiently to produce one or other of the phenomena above described so also by the different weight of plates of glass by other accidental circumstances for instance by slipping the plate on the side of the convex glass where the pressure cannot be so strong as in the centre all the gradations above described can be produced in succession 442 in order to observe the phenomenon it is necessary to look obliquely on the surface where it appears but above all it is to be remarked that by stooping still more and looking at the appearance under a more acute angle the circles not only grow larger but other circles are developed from the centre of which no trace is to be discovered when we look perpendicularly even through the strongest magnifiers 443. In order to exhibit a phenomenon in its greatest beauty, the utmost attention should be paid to the cleanness of the glasses. If the experiment is made with plate glass adapted for mirrors, the glass should be handled with gloves. The inner surfaces, which must come in contact with the utmost nicety, may be most conveniently cleaned before the experiment, and the outer surfaces should be kept clean while the pressure is increased. 444. From what has been said, it will be seen that an exact contact of two smooth surfaces is necessary. Polished glasses are best adapted for the purpose. Plates of glass exhibit the most brilliant colors when they fit closely together. And for this reason, the phenomenon will increase in beauty if exhibited under an air pump by exhausting the air. 445 the appearance of the colored rings may be produced in the greatest perfection by placing a convex and concave glass together which have been ground on similar segments of circles i have never seen the effect more brilliant than with the object glass of an achromatic telescope in which the crown glass and flint glass were necessarily in the closest contact 446 a remarkable appearance takes place when dissimilar surfaces are pressed together for example a polished crystal and a plate of glass the appearance does not at all exhibit itself in large flowing waves as in the combination of glass with glass but it is small and angular and as it were disjointed thus it appears that the surface of the polished crystal which consists of infinitely small sections of lamellae does not come so uninterruptedly in contact with the glass as another glass plate would 447 the appearance of color vanishes on the strongest pressure which so intimately unites the two surfaces that they appear to make but one substance it is this which occasions the dark centre because the pressed lens no longer reflects any light from this point for the very same point when seen against the light is perfectly clear and transparent on relaxing the pressure the colours in like manner gradually diminish and disappear entirely when the surfaces are separated four hundred and forty eight these same appearances occur in two similar cases if entirely transparent masses become partially separated the surfaces of their parts being still sufficiently in contact we see the same circles and waves more or less they may be produced in great beauty by plunging a hot mass of glass in water the different fissures and cracks enabling us to observe the colors in various forms nature often exhibits the same phenomena in split rock crystals four hundred and forty nine this appearance again frequently displays itself in the mineral world in those kinds of stone which by nature have a tendency to exfoliate these original lamellae are it is true so intimately united that stones of this kind appear altogether transparent and colourless yet the internal layers become separated from various accidental causes without altogether destroying the contact thus the appearance which is now familiar to us by the foregoing description often occurs in nature particularly in calcareous spars the specularis adularia and other minerals of similar structure hence it shows an ignorance of the proximate causes of an appearance so often accidentally produced to consider it so important in mineralogy and to attach a special value to the specimens exhibiting it four hundred and fifty we have yet to speak of the very remarkable inversion of this appearance as related by men of science 
if namely instead of looking at the colours by a reflected light we examine them by a transmitted light the opposite colours are said to appear and in a mode corresponding with that which we have before described as physiological the colours evoking each other instead of blue we should thus see red yellow instead of red green etc and vice versa we reserve experiments in detail the rather as we have ourselves still some doubts on this point four hundred and fifty one if we were now called upon to give some general explanation of these epoptical colours as they appear under the first condition and to show their connection with the previously detailed physical phenomena we might proceed to do so as follows 452. The glasses employed for the experiments are to be regarded as the utmost possible practical approach to transparence. By the intimate contact, however, occasioned by the pressure applied to them, their surfaces, we are persuaded, immediately become in a very slight degree dimmed. Within this semi-transparence, the colours immediately appear, and every circle comprehends the whole scale. For when the two opposites, yellow and blue, are united by their red extremities, pure red appears the green on the other hand as in prismatic experiments when yellow and blue touch four hundred and fifty three we have already repeatedly found that where colour exists at all the whole scale is soon called into existence a similar principle may be said to lurk in the nature of every physical phenomenon it already follows from the idea of polar opposition from which an elementary unity or completeness results 454. The fact that a colour exhibited by transmitted light is different from that displayed by reflected light reminds us of those dioptrical colours of the first class which we found were produced precisely in the same way through semi-opacity. That here, too, a diminution of transparency exists, there can scarcely be a doubt. For the addition of the perfect smooth plates of glass, an addition so strong that they remain hanging to each other, produces a degree of union which deprives each of the two surfaces in some degree of its smoothness and transparency. The fullest proof may, however, be found in the fact that in the centre, where the lens is most strongly pressed on the other glass, and where a perfect union is accomplished, a complete transparency takes place in which we no longer perceive any colour. All this may be hereafter confirmed by a recapitulation of the whole. 455. Second condition. If after breathing on a plate of glass, the breath is merely wiped away with the finger, and if we then again immediately breathe on the glass, we see very vivid colours gliding through each other. These, as the moisture evaporates, change their place and at last vanish altogether. If this operation is repeated, the colours are more vivid and beautiful, and remain longer than they did the first time. 456. Quickly as this appearance passes, and confused as it appears to be, I have yet remarked the following effects. At first, all the principal colours appear with their combinations. On breathing more strongly, the appearance may be perceived in some order. In this succession, it may be remarked that when the breath in evaporating becomes contracted from all sides towards the centre, the blue colour vanishes last. 457. The phenomenon appears more readily between the minute lines which the action of passing the fingers leaves on the clear surface. A somewhat rough state of the surface of the glass is otherwise requisite. On some glass, the appearance may be produced by merely breathing. In other cases, the wiping with the fingers is necessary. I have even met with polished mirror glasses, one side of which immediately showed the colours vividly, the other not. To judge from some remaining pieces, the former was originally the front of the glass, the latter the side which is covered with quicksilver. 458 these experiments may be best made in cold weather because the glass may be more quickly and distinctly breathed upon and the breath evaporates more suddenly in severe frost the phenomenon may be observed on a large scale while travelling in a carriage the glass is being well cleaned and all closed the breath of the person within is very gently diffused over the glass and immediately produces the most vivid play of colours how far they may present a regular succession i have not been able to remark but they appear particularly vivid when they have a dark object as a background 
this alternation of colours does not however last long for as soon as the breath gathers in drops or freezes to points of ice the appearance is at once at an end four hundred and fifty nine third condition the two foregoing experiments of the pressure and breathing may be united namely by breathing on a plate of glass and immediately after pressing the other upon it the colours then appear as in the case of two glasses unbreathed upon with this difference that the moisture occasions here and there an interruption of the undulations on pushing one glass away from the other the moisture appears iridescent as it evaporates four hundred and sixty it might however be asserted that this combined experiment exhibits no more than each single experiment for it appears the colours excited by pressure disappear in proportion as the glasses are less in contact and the moisture then evaporates with its own colours four hundred and sixty one fourth condition iridescent appearances are observable in almost all bubbles soap bubbles are the most commonly known and the effect in question is thus exhibited in the easiest note but it may be observed in wine beer in pure spirit and again especially in the froth of chocolate four hundred and sixty two as in the above cases we require an infinitely narrow space between two surfaces which are in contact so we can consider the pellicle of the soap bubble as an infinitely thin lamina between two elastic bodies for the appearance in fact takes place between the air within which distends the bubble and the atmospheric air four hundred and sixty three the bubble when first produced is colourless then coloured stripes like those in marble paper begin to appear these at length spread over the whole surface or rather are driven round it as it is distended four hundred and sixty four in a single bubble suffered to hang from the straw or a tube the appearance of colour is difficult to observe for the quick rotation prevents any accurate observation and all the colours seem to mix together yet we can perceive that the colours begin at the orifice of the tube the solution itself may however be blown into carefully so that only one bubble shall appear this remains white colourless if not much agitated but if the solution is not too watery circles appear round the perpendicular axis of the bubble these being near each other are commonly composed alternately of green and red lastly several bubbles may be produced together by the same means in this case the colours appear on the sides where two bubbles have pressed each other flat four hundred and sixty five the bubbles of chocolate froth may perhaps be even more conveniently observed than those of soap though smaller they remain longer in these owing to the heat an impulse a movement is produced and sustained which appears necessary to the development and succession of the appearances four hundred and sixty six if the bubble is small or shut in between others colored lines chase each other over the surface resembling marbled paper all the colours of the scale are seen to pass through each other the pure the augmented the combined all distinctly clear and beautiful in small bubbles the appearance lasts for a considerable time four hundred and sixty seven if the bubble is larger or if it becomes by degrees detached owing to the bursting of others near we perceive that this impulsion and attraction of the colours has as it were an end in view for on the highest point of the bubble we see a small circle appear which is yellow in the centre the other remaining coloured lines move constantly round this with a vermicular action four hundred and sixty eight in a short time the circle enlarges and sinks downwards on all sides in the centre the yellow remains below and on the outside it becomes red and soon blue below this again appears a new circle of the same series of colours if they approximate sufficiently a green is produced by the union of the border colours four hundred and sixty nine when i could count three such leading circles the centre was colourless and this space became by degrees larger as the circles sank lower till at last the bubble burst four hundred and seventy fifth condition 
very delicate pellicles may be formed in various ways on these films we discover a very lively play of colours either in the usual order or more confusedly passing through each other the water in which lime has been slaked soon skims over with a coloured pellicle the same happens on the surface of stagnant water especially if impregnated with iron the lamellae of the fine tartar which adheres to bottles especially in red french wine exhibit the most brilliant colours on being exposed to the light if carefully detached drops of oil on water brandy and other fluids produce also similar circles and brilliant effects but the most beautiful experiment that can be made is the following let aqua fortis not too strong be poured into a flat saucer and then with a brush drop on it some of the varnish used by engravers to cover certain portions during the process of biting their plates after quick commotion there presently appears a film which spreads itself out in circles and immediately produces the most vivid appearances of colour four hundred and seventy one sixth condition when metals are heated colours rapidly succeeding each other appear on the surface these colours can however be arrested at will four hundred and seventy two if a piece of polished steel is heated it will at a certain degree of warmth be overspread with yellow if taken suddenly away from the fire this yellow remains four hundred and seventy three as the steel becomes hotter the yellow appears darker intenser and presently passes into red this is difficult to arrest for it hastens very quickly to bright blue four hundred and seventy four this beautiful blue is to be arrested if the steel is suddenly taken out of the heat and buried in ashes the blue steel works are produced in this way if again the steel is held longer over the fire it soon becomes a light blue and so it remains four hundred and seventy five these colours pass like a breath over the plate of steel each seems to fly before the other but in reality each successive hue is constantly developed from the preceding one four hundred and seventy six if we hold a penknife in the flame of a light a coloured stripe will appear across the blade the portion of the stripe which was nearest to the flame is light blue this melts into blue red the red is in the centre then follow yellow red and yellow four hundred and seventy seven this phenomenon is deducible from the preceding ones for the portion of the blade next to the handle is less heated than the end which is in the flame and thus all the colours which in other cases exhibited themselves in succession must here appear at once and may thus be permanently preserved four hundred and seventy eight robert boyle gives this succession of colours as follows a florido flavo ad flavum saturum et rubescentem quem artifices sanguineum vocant inde at languidum postea ad saturiorem cianeum this would be quite correct if the words languidus and saturior were to change places how far the observation is correct that the different colours have a relation to the degree of temper which the metal afterwards acquires we leave to others to decide the colours are here only indications of the different degrees of heat note r four hundred and seventy nine when lead is calcined the surface is first greyish this greyish powder with greater heat becomes yellow and then orange silver too exhibits colours when heated the fracture of silver in the process of refining belongs to the same class of examples when metallic glasses melt colours in like manner appear on the surface four hundred and eighty seventh condition when the surface of glass becomes decomposed the accidental opacity blind verden of glass has been already noticed the term blind verden is employed to denote that the surface of the glass is also affected as to appear dim to us four hundred and eighty one white glass becomes blind soonest cast and afterwards polished glass is also liable to be so affected the bluish less the green least four hundred and eighty two 
of the two sides of a plate of glass one is called the mirror side it is that which in the oven lies uppermost on which one may observe roundish elevations it is smoother than the other which is undermost in the oven and on which scratches may be sometimes observed on this account the mirror side is placed facing the interior of rooms because it is less affected by the moisture adhering to it from within than the other would be and the glass is thus less liable to become blind four hundred and eighty three this half opacity or dimness of the glass assumes by degrees an appearance of colour which may become very vivid and in which perhaps a certain succession or otherwise regular order might be discovered four hundred and eighty four having thus traced the physical colours from their simplest effects to the present instances where these fleeting appearances are found to be fixed in bodies we are in fact arrived at the point where the chemical colours begin nay we have in some sort already passed those limits a circumstance which may excite a favourable prejudice for the consistency of our statement by way of conclusion to this part of our inquiry we subjoin a general observation which may not be without its bearing on the common connecting principle of the phenomena that have been adduced four hundred and eighty five the colouring of steel and the appearances analogous to it might perhaps be easily deduced from the doctrine of the semi-opaque mediums polished steel reflects light powerfully we may consider the colour produced by the heat as a slight degree of dimness hence a bright yellow must immediately appear this as the dimness increases must still appear deeper more condensed and redder and at last pure and ruby red the colour has now reached the extreme point of depth and if we suppose the same degree of semi-opacity still to continue the dimness would now spread itself over a dark ground first producing a violet then a dark blue and at last a light blue and thus complete the series of the appearances we will not assert that this mode of explanation will suffice in all cases our object is rather to point out the road by which the all comprehensive formula the very key of the enigma may be at last discovered End of section twenty five Section 26 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Crosby. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 26. Part 3. Chemical Colors. 486. We give this denomination to colors which we can produce, and more or less fix, in certain bodies, which we can render more intense, which we can again take away and communicate to other bodies, and to which, therefore, we ascribe a certain permanency. Duration is their prevailing characteristic. 487. In this view, the chemical colors were formally distinguished with various epithets. They were called color propriety, corporee, material, very, Permanente fixi. 488. In the preceding chapter, we observed how the fluctuating and transient nature of the physical colors becomes gradually fixed, thus forming the natural transition to our present subject. 489. Color becomes fixed in bodies more or less permanently, superficially, or thoroughly. 490. All bodies are susceptible of color. It can either be excited, rendered intense, and gradually fixed in them, or at least communicated to them. 34. Chemical Contrast 491. In the examination of colored appearances, we had occasion everywhere to take notice of a principle of contrast. So again, in approaching the precincts of chemistry, we find a chemical contrast of a remarkable nature. We speak here, with reference to our present purpose, only of that which is comprehended under the general names of acid and alkali. 492. We characterize the chromatic contrast in conformity with all other physical contrasts as a more or less, subscribing the plus to the yellow side, the minus to the blue, and we now find that these two divisions correspond with the chemical contrasts. The yellow and the yellow-red affect the acids, the blue and the blue-red, the alkali. 
Thus, the phenomena of chemical colors, although still necessarily mixed up with other considerations, admit of being traced with sufficient simplicity. 493. The principal phenomena in chemical colors are produced by the oxidation of metals, and it will be seen how important this consideration is at the onset. Other facts which come into the account, and which are worthy of attention, will be examined under separate heads. And during this, we, however, expressly state that we only propose to offer some preparatory suggestions to the chemist in a very general way, without entering into the nicer chemical problems and questions, or presuming to decide on them. Our object is only to give a sketch of the mode in which, according to our convictions, the chemical theory of colors may be connected with general physics. End of section 26. Section 27 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joanne Crosby. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 27. 35. White. 494. In treating of the diatropic colors of the first class, we have already in some degree anticipated this subject. Transparent substances may be said to be in the highest class of inorganic matter. With these, colorless semi-transparence is closely connected, and white may be considered the last opaque degree of this. 495. Pure water crystallized to snow appears white, for the transparence of the separate parts makes no transparent whole. Various crystallized salts, when deprived to a certain extent of moisture, appear as white powder. The accidentally opaque state of a pure transparent substance might be called white. Thus, pounded glass appears as a white powder. The cessation of a combining power and the exhibition of the atomic quality of the substance might at the same time be taken into account. 496. The known undecomposed earths are in their pure state all white. They pass to a state of transparence by natural crystallization. Silex becomes rock crystal, argyle, mica, magnesia, talc, calcareous earth, and barte appear transparent in various spars. 497. As in the coloring of mineral bodies, the metallic oxides will often invite our attention. We observe, in conclusion, that metals, when slightly oxidated, at first appear white, as lead is converted to white lead by vegetable acid. 36. Black. 498. Black is not exhibited in so elementary a state as white. We met with it in the vegetable kingdom in semi-combustion, and charcoal, a substance especially worthy of attention on other accounts, exhibits a black color. Again, if woods, for example boards, owing to the action of light, air, and moisture, are deprived in part of their combustibility, there appears first the gray, then the black color. So again, we can convert even portions of animal substance to charcoal by semi-combustion. 499. In the same manner, we often find that a suboxidation takes place in metals when the black color is to be produced. Various metals, particularly iron, become black by slight oxidation, by vinegar, by mild acid fermentations, for example, a decoction of rice and C. 500. Again, it may be inferred that deoxidation may produce black. This occurs in the preparation of ink, which becomes yellow by the solution of iron and strong sulfuric acid, but when partly deoxidized by the infusion of gall nuts, appears black. 37. First excitation of color. 501. In the division of physical colors, where semi-transparent mediums were considered, we saw colors antecedently to white and black. In the present case, we assume a white and black already produced and fixed, and the question is how color may be excited in them. 502. Here, too, we can say white that becomes darkened or dimmed inclines to yellow, 
black as it becomes lighter inclines to blue. 503. Yellow appears on the active plus side, immediately in the light, the bright, the white. All white surfaces easily assume a yellow tinge. Paper, linen, wool, silk, wax, transparent fluids again, which have a tendency to combustion, easily become yellow. In other words, they easily pass into a very slight state of semi-transparence. 504. So again, the excitement on the passive side, the tendency to obscure, dark black, is immediately accompanied with blue, or rather with a reddish blue, iron dissolved in sulfuric acid and much diluted with water, if held to the light in a glass, exhibits a beautiful violet color as soon as a few drops only of the infusion of gall nuts are added. This color presents the peculiar hues of the dark topaz. The orphanion of a burnt red, as the ancients expressed it. 505. Whether any color can be excited in the pure earths by the chemical operations of nature and art, without the admixture of metal oxides, is an important question generally, indeed answered in the negative. It is perhaps connected with the question, to what extent changes may be produced in the earths through oxidation? 506. Undoubtedly, the negation of the above question is confirmed by the circumstances that whenever mineral colors are found, some trace of metal, especially of iron, shows itself. We are thus naturally led to consider how easily iron becomes oxidized, how easily the oxidate of iron assumes different colors, how infinitely divisible it is, and how quickly it communicates its color. It were to be wished, notwithstanding, that new experiments could be made in regard to the above point, so as to either confirm or remove any doubt. 507. However this may be, the susceptibility of the earth with regard to colors already existing is very great. A luminous earth is thus particularly distinguished. 508. In proceeding to consider the metals, which in the inorganic world have the almost exclusive prerogative of appearing colored, we find that, in their pure independent natural state, they are already distinguished from the pure earths by a tendency to some one color or other. 509. While silver approximates most to pure white, nay, really represents pure white, heightened by metallic splendor, steel, tin, lead, and so forth incline towards pale blue-gray. Gold, on the other hand, deepens to pure yellow, Copper approaches a red hue, which, under certain circumstances, increases almost to bright red, but which again returns to a yellow-golden color when combined with zinc. 510. But if metals in their pure state have so specific a determination towards this or that exhibition of color, they are, through the effect of oxidation, in some degree reduced to a common character. For the elementary colors now come forth in their purity, and although this or that metal appears to have a particular tendency to this or that color, we find some that can go through the whole circle of hues, others that are capable of exhibiting more than one color. Tin, however, is distinguished by its comparative inaptitude to becoming colored. We propose to give a table hereafter, showing how far the different metals can be more or less made to exhibit the different colors. 511. When the clean, smooth surface of a pure metal, on being heated, becomes overspread with a mantling color, which passes through a series of appearances as the heat increases, this, we are persuaded, indicates the aptitude of the metal to pass through the whole range of colors. We find this phenomenon most beautifully exhibited in polished steel, but silver, copper, brass, lead, and tin easily present similar appearances. A superficial oxidation is probably here taking place, as may be inferred from the effects of the operation when continued, especially in the more easily oxidizable metals. 512. The same conclusion may be drawn from the fact that iron is more easily oxidizable by acid liquids when it's red hot, for in this case the two effects concur with each other. We observe again that steel, accordingly as it is hardened in different stages of its colorification, may exhibit a difference of elasticity. This is quite natural, for the various appearances of color indicates various degrees of heat. 513. 
if we look beyond this superficial mantling, this pellicle of color, we observe that as metals are oxidized throughout their masses, white or black appears with the first degree of heat, as may be seen in white lead, iron, and quicksilver. 514. If we examine further and look for the actual exhibition of color, we find it most frequently on the plus side. The mantling so often mentioned of smooth metallic surfaces begins with yellow. Iron passes presently into yellow ochre, lead from white lead to massicot, quicksilver from Ethiops to yellow turbith. The solutions of gold and platinum in acids are yellow. 515. The exhibition on the minus side are less frequent. Copper slightly oxidized appears blue. In the preparation of Prussian blue, alkalis are employed. 516. Generally, however, these appearances of color are of so mutable a nature the chemists look upon them as deceptive tests, at least in the nicer gradations. For ourselves, as we can only treat of these matters in a general way, we merely observe that the appearances of color in metals may be classed according to their origin, manifold appearances, and cessation as various results of oxidation, hyperoxidation, aboxidation, and deoxidation. End of section 27. Section 28 of Theory of Colors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Theory of Colors by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Translated by Charles Eastlake. Section 28. 38. Augmentation of Color. 517. The augmentation of color exhibits itself as a condensation, a fullness, a darkening of the hue. We have before seen, in treating of colorless mediums, that by increasing the degree of opacity in the medium, we can deepen a bright object from the lightest yellow to the intensest ruby red. Blue, on the other hand, increases to the most beautiful violet if we rarefy and diminish a semi-opaque medium, itself lighted, but through which we see darkness. 150, 151. 518. If the color is positive, a similar color appears in the intenser state. Thus, if we fill a white porcelain cup with a pure yellow liquor, the fluid will appear to become gradually redder toward the bottom, and at last appears orange. If we pour a pure blue solution into another cup, the upper portion will exhibit a sky blue that towards the bottom a beautiful violet. If the cup is placed in the sun, the shadowed side, even of the upper portion, is already violet. If we throw a shadow with the hand, or any other substance, over the illuminated portion, the shadow, in like manner, appears reddish. 519. This is one of the most important appearances connected with the doctrine of colors, for we here manifestly find that a difference of quantity produces a corresponding qualified impression on our senses. In speaking of the last class of epoptical colors, 452, 485, we stated our conjecture that the coloring of steel might perhaps be traced to the doctrine of the semi-transparent mediums, and we would here again recall this to the reader's recollection. 520. All chemical augmentation of color, again, is the immediate consequence of continued excitation. The augmentation advances constantly and unremittingly, and it is to be observed that the increase of intenseness is most common on the plus side. Yellow iron ochre increases, as well by fire as by other operations, to a very strong red. Massicot is increased to red lead, turbith to vermilion, which last obtains a very high degree of the yellow red. An intimate saturation of the metal by the acid and its separation to infinity take place together with the above effects. 521. The augmentation on the minus side is less frequent, but we observe that the more pure and condensed the Prussian blue or cobalt glass is prepared, the more readily it assumes a reddish hue and inclines to the violet. 522. The French have a happy expression for the less perceptible tendency of yellow and blue towards red. They say the color has an ile de rouge, which we might perhaps express by a reddish glance. Einen rocklichen Blick. 39. Culmination. 
523. This is the consequence of still progressing augmentation. Red, in which neither yellow nor blue is to be detected, here constitutes the acme. 524. If we wish to select a striking example of a culmination on the plus side, we again find it in the colored steel, which attains the bright red acme, and can be arrested at this point. 525. Were we here to employ the terminology before proposed, we should say that the first oxidation produces yellow, the hyperoxidation yellow-red, that here a kind of maximum exists, and that then an ab-oxidation, and lastly a deoxidation takes place. 526. High degrees of oxidation produce a bright red. Gold in solution, precipitated by a solution of tin, appears bright red. Oxide of arsenic, in combination with sulfur, produces a ruby color. 527. How far, however, a kind of sub-oxidation may cooperate in some culminations is matter for inquiry, for an influence of alkalis on yellow-red also appears to produce the culmination, the color reaching the acme by being forced towards the minus side. 528. The Dutch prepare a color known by the name of vermilion from the best Hungarian cinnabar, which exhibits the brightest yellow-red. This vermilion is still only a cinnabar, which, however, approximates the pure red, and it may be conjectured that alkalis are used to bring it nearer to the culminating point. 529. Vegetable juices, treated in this way, offer very striking examples of the above effects. The coloring matter of turmeric, anato, dyer's saffron, and other vegetables, being extracted with spirits of wine, exhibit tints of yellow, yellow-red, and hyacinth red. These, by the admixture of alkalis, pass to the culminating point, and even beyond it to blue-red. 530. No instance of a culmination on the minus side has come to my knowledge in the mineral and vegetable kingdoms. In the animal kingdom, the juice of the morix is remarkable. Of its augmentation and culmination on the minus side, we shall hereafter have occasion to speak. 40. Fluxation. 531. The mutability of colors is so great that even those pigments, which may have been considered to be defined and arrested, still admit of slight variations on one side or the other. This mutability is most remarkable near the culminating point, and is affected in a very striking manner by the alternate employment of acids and alkalis. 532. To express this appearance in dyeing, the French make use of the word verir, to turn from one side to the other. They thus very adroitly convey an idea which others attempt to express by terms indicating the compound it used. 533. The effect produced with litmus is one of the most known and striking of this kind. This coloring substance is tendered red-blue by means of alkalis. The red-blue is very readily changed to red-yellow by means of acid, and again returns to its first state by again employing alkalis. The question whether a culminating point is to be discovered and arrested by nice experiments is left to those who are practiced in these operations. Dyeing, especially scarlet dyeing, might afford a variety of examples of this fluctuation. 41. Passage through the whole scale. 534. The first excitation and gradual increase of color take place more on the plus than on the minus side. So, also, in passing through the whole scale, Color exhibits itself most on the plus side. 535. A passage of this kind, regular and evident to the senses, from yellow through red to blue, is apparent in the coloring of steel. 536. The metals may be arrested at various points of the colorific circle by various degrees and kinds of oxidation. 537. As they also appear green, a question arises whether chemists know any instance in the mineral kingdom of a constant transition from yellow through green to blue and vice versa. Oxide of iron melted with glass produces first a green and with a more powerful heat a blue color. 538. We may here observe of green generally that it appears, especially in an atomic sense and certainly in a pure sense, when we mix blue and yellow. But again an impure and dirty yellow soon gives us the impression of green. Yellow and black already produce green. This, however, is owing to the affinity between black and blue. An imperfect yellow, such as that of sulphur, gives us the impression of a greenish hue. Thus, again, an imperfect blue appears green. 
the green of wine bottles arises, it appears, from an imperfect union of the oxide of iron with the glass. If we produce a more complete union by greater heat, a beautiful blue glass is the result. 539. From all this, it appears that a certain chasm exists in nature between yellow and blue, the opposite character of which, it is true, may be done away atomically by dew in mixture, and thus combined to green. But the true reconciliation between yellow and blue, it appears, only takes place by means of red. 540. The process, however, which appears unattainable in inorganic substances, we shall find to be possible when we turn our attention to organic productions, for in these, the passage through the whole circle from yellow through green and blue to red really takes place. End of section 28. Recording by Todd.